Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It is Monday, December 9th, 2019. I hope you had an awesome weekend and your week is off to a really good start as well. Now, if you're anything like me, you probably consider at least 90% of what the federal government does as a violation of the Constitution. As soon as they try to pass it, as soon as they issue a new regulation, it's all unconstitutional. Now, in the Founders' time, these type of acts were known to be called usurpations. And many leading founders warned us against turning a blind eye to usurpations, no matter how small. So today, we're going to be talking about a number of leading founders on usurpation. We're going to cover some dictionaries that they would have used at the time to define the word and advice to oppose a disease at its beginning before it kills you, really. First of all, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 930 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. We have a number of video and audio channels. We do a live stream video only that is uh, YouTube, Facebook, Periscope, DLive, and Twitch. We also have archived video versions at brighteon.com, bittubers.com, and bitshoot.com. Of course, the podcast edition, for those of you who are listening and driving and doing other things, for example, listening while working, I appreciate all of you. We've got iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and elsewhere. Find all of our archives, all of the different platforms we're on, all of our social media channels, the ways to subscribe to our newsletter, the way to kick in a couple of bucks a month and join our membership program and financially support us. All of the show notes and the links that I reference in each episode, all of this is over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to to Liberty. I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. So uh, let's take a quick look over in the live chat and then we'll get right into the show. I want to say hello to everybody. I appreciate you joining me, whether it's live or in the archive. And of course, smashing the like, leaving comments, sharing reviews, all that stuff triggers the, the platform's algorithms and shows the program to more people. So I really appreciate that. Hi to Austrian Watchmen, Essential Freedom, John Blackwell, Dan Reed, Patricia Dance, Funky Euphemism, Ward Lawrence. Good to see you on the live stream, Ward. Uh, Lois or Loic A, Tyler B, and everyone else, wherever you are, wherever you're watching or listening. Again, extremely grateful for you spending some time with me today. Let's get into this. And I first want to start out with some dictionaries from the founding generation. If you're a regular viewer of the show or listener, or a regular reader of the 10th Amendment Center website, you know that we often cite dictionaries from the founding generation. Because if you want to understand a word, what it was meant to be to the founders, because let me back up. The Constitution is a legal document. And if, like any legal document, the, the meaning of that legal document in legal force, in law, is what it was at the time that it was given legal force, that is ratified by the people of several states. You have to understand how they understood those words, what they were defined to be at the time that they gave it legal force. Some words, actually, definitions change over time. So we need to actually consider various dictionaries, popular for lay people, and then also law dictionaries, anywhere from like 1760, sometimes a little earlier, to the 1790s is really the best range. So I've covered a number of them, for example, in Dictionary of the English Language, that's one of the most popular ones. I think the one that was probably referenced most would have been a 1785 edition off the top of my head. I have access here in Google Books, they've got tons of these digitized, which is pretty incredible. And I will put links to each of the three that I'm going to cite on this episode in the show notes at 10th Amendment Center.com slash path to liberty. So you can use them to look up other constitutional terms or important words that apply to uh, issues under the Constitution today. So this first one is Samuel Johnson's 1792 Dictionary of the English Language. We're defining usurpation. Let me pull this up here. Actually, I think I can do this larger for those of you who are watching. That way you can see it. Usurpation, of course. Uh, it's a little difficult to read here, but I'll just kind of go through it. In Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language, this is probably one of the most well-read dictionaries. They call it forcible, unjust, illegal seizure or possession. So if we're talking about 
a usurpation of power. We're recognizing that no government in the American system is sovereign. Sovereignty means final authority, and the people of the several states held that final authority. And when government officials, whether at any level of government, but we're primarily talking about federal power here under the Constitution, when they take power that doesn't belong to them, they're usur usurping it. It's unjust, illegal seizure or possession of those powers. And that's in Samuel Johnson's 1792. Here's another one that I think is also very important uh, to look at, no matter what issue we're looking at, is Nathan Bailey's 1775 Dictionary. And in here, he says, usurpation is defined as a taking wrongfully to one's own use, which belongs to another. Usurpation of power means you're stealing power. Going on, we also have Thomas Sheridan's 1789 Dictionary and usurpation. Oh, man, I'm having a hard time reading this. The font is so small. Forcible, unjust, illegal seizure or possession. Again, very similar. So we know that this is a consistent view through three of the most widely circulated popular dictionaries of the time. I did not look into the legal or law dictionaries because so many of leading founders and legal experts at that time, and we'll cover this briefly, use the same type of language when they're talking about usurpation. So just as the base understanding, we know that when the founders or any of the founders talked about usurpation, they were talking about exercising power that has not been delegated to the, the government in the first place. Here's St. George Tucker, who wrote in view of the Constitution of the United States. This is the first long, full length legal analysis of the Constitution written in 1803. Jefferson gave copies of it to his cabinet, I believe. And St. George Tucker put it this way. Every attempt such a, to affect such a union, that is to align sovereignty, final authority with the government rather than acknowledging final authorities with the people, is treason against that sovereignty in the actors and every extension of the administrative authority beyond its just constitutional limits is absolutely an act of usurpation in the government. Every single time they do something, large or small, that wasn't delegated to them in the Constitution is stealing power that doesn't belong to them. And he puts it this way. He takes one of the hardest line stands on this at all. He says, he ended up saying in another area that this was treason against the sovereignty of the people. That is not respecting the final authority of the people. And that's Tucker in 1803. And I've covered many times on this show George Washington's very famous farewell address in 1796, originally drafted by James Madison, a kind of a collaboration between Madison and Washington over a number of years. Washington held on to it after his first term. I believe he had it drafted for his first term, but he decided to stick around for a second. And one of the things that he talked about, and I cover regularly, is usurpation, turning a blind eye, letting government steal power, not doing anything about it. This was an incredible warning. And if you watch the show regularly, you know I talk about this often, but it's so important to bring it up. And he put it this way, let there be no change by usurpation. He said, if you need to change the Constitution, change it by amendment. There's a process for it. But don't let them just change it on a whim, by fiat, by exercising power, no matter how necessary. This is how Washington put it. He said, for though this, in one instance, may be the instrument of good, it is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. The precedent must always greatly overbalance and permanent evil any partial or transient benefit which the use can at any time yield. Short version... If you need to make a change, there's a process. Do not, no matter how much you agree with the policy, do not ever turn a blind eye to them just exchanging the power, expanding their own power for an emergency situation. The, to, it's just going to be this one time. I did an entire episode on red flag laws talking about opposing a disease at its beginning a few months ago. 
And it's the same idea. As soon as you turn a blind eye to one issue because you may like the policy now or you don't think it's a big problem for them to do it. Like there's bigger problems to deal with. So let's not worry about this one uh, violation of the Constitution. I agree with you, Bolden, that such and such is a violation of the Constitution. This is something I'll hear pretty regularly. But we've got bigger fish to fry. And yes, we all have to spend our time wisely, strategically. But anytime someone's pointing out that something's unconstitutional, you don't want to like poo poo them and tell them that it's stupid to waste their time on it. If it's important to them, of course, you should do that. You should encourage them to do this more, because as Washington told us, even the smallest, even the smallest type of usurpation is the customary weapon. He's not even talking about it as a process. It is a weapon against the people. They're arming up by usurping power and they're creating new precedent to do it more and more and more. And another leading founder that I talked about, I've talked about pretty regularly on this show is John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution. And this is very similar to what he had to say. But let's go back to Tucker again in 1803. And he's talking about this same process. This is a consistent view from the founders. He said, it is easy to perceive that a government originally founded upon consent, because earlier in this uh, this section of his book, he's basically saying a free government is only only exists upon free consent, voluntary consent. Let me see if I can find that quote really handy. When a government is founding, founded upon voluntary consent, that is a really key phrase there, an agreement of a people uniting themselves for the common benefit, then the people are free. If it's voluntary and consensual, then it's free. But he goes on with this warning. He says it's easy to perceive that a government originally founded upon consent and compact may by gradual usurpations, again, gradual, small, consistent, stealing theft of power on the part of public functionaries, change its type altogether and become a government of force. So it starts out as a voluntary union, a voluntary agreement, consensual. But like Washington warned uh, seven years before Tucker wrote this, and there are other warnings that I'm going to get to even decades before that, it's consistent with what Washington had to say. But when you turn a blind eye to that usurpation, eventually you end up with a government of force, and it only exists through power and force. And what Jan John Adams in 1776, they use fear as the foundation for most governments. Tucker goes on, he says, in this case, the people are completely enslaved as if the original foundation of the government has been laid by conquest. So you can have a government that starts out in freedom. Now, I know there's going to be friends of mine who say government, you can't say and freedom at the same time. That's another conversation. But if you start out with a situation where people are, in theory, even consenting to what's going on, it's a free situation or a large degree of freedom. Eventually, if you allow them just to violate the rules, you turn a blind eye, you go along with it, you encourage it, it eventually will become a situation where it's no different than if that same government was founded on conquest. I think this is a very apt description for what we live under today. Although some people would tell me, dude, you know, you've got the freedom to be talking here and broadcasting live. Yes, I am doing this. But at some point, a government person could say that I am dangerous and have me deplatformed. It's not freedom if it's only relying on government not violating that freedom. And that's uh, Patrick Henry in his great one of his great speeches in the Virginia Ratifying Convention basically said anytime people relied on their rulers to be good people, they were always going to lose their liberty. And that was his study of history. And I think that plays out in the last couple of centuries as well. So 1803, exact same thing. You can have small, silent, gradual usurpations of power and eventually by having that, you're going to create a situation down the line, and I think we're there today, where basically you have a government that was established by force in, the, in practice. That's how it plays out. Now, here's Dickinson, and I've covered this before on the show a few times, but he wrote a series of letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania in response to the hated Townsend Acts of 1767. So a series of 12 papers from late 1767 into 1768, 
talking about various foundational principles and rallying people to oppose the Townsend Acts. And he gave this example in paper number nine or letter number nine. I think it was number nine. This comes from an article that we sent out uh, as an email campaign. If you're on our email list, you very likely read it. Hopefully you're opening all of our emails. Uh, this was an article by Mike Meharry comparing uh, the issues of today and talking about them and talking about opposing a disease at its beginning. But one of the great examples that he's focusing on this article was, was Dickinson's example in letter number nine where he talked about Spain. He said specifically Spain at one time, he was looking back through history, Spain at one time, he said, was free. He said no money could be raised without the people's consent, basically the par through their parliament. It was called the Cortes. But there was a war that was going on. Even the king couldn't just raise money on its own. And there was this war going on and the king went to them and said, look, we gotta be able to, we've got to be able to raise more money. We're running out of cash to carry on this war. So we've got to do this. And I know that, uh, it, you know, you've got to give total consent to this. But what happens? What happens if I need it in an emergency situation when you guys aren't assembled? We're going to be in a lot of trouble. And there was a lot of debate. This is how Dickinson, I'm just paraphrasing how Dickinson described it. And Dickinson said, that said there was a lot of debate on this, a lot of fierce opposition. But they eventually relented and said, you know what, in this one time only, we're going to allow you to raise money without calling us back into session and having a big debate about it and you can do it on your own. And he said, this is how Dickinson wrote it. He, the king asked that he might be allowed for that emergency only to raise more money without assembling the Cortez. And Dickinson put it this way, this single concession was a precedent for other concessions of the like kind until at last the crown obtained a general power of raising money in cases of necessity. Short version, one usurpation. One time allowing them to take more power for an emergency means, and this is how Dickinson said, from that period, the Cortez, the parliament there, ceased to be useful and the people ceased to be free. And he ended that letter with a very, very important quote, a Latin. He ended each one with a Latin phrase. This was Venienti occurrete morbo, oppose a disease at its beginning. Because once you let the disease take root, as John Adams once said, he said, like a cancer, encroachments upon the Constitution are like a cancer, and they grow and they end up killing you. So that was Dickinson. But what do you do about it? What do you do? How do you oppose this? You can't just talk about it. Theophilus Parsons, I think, is one of the most unsung founders, advocates of the Constitution during the ratification pe period. He was from Massachusetts. And this article, Resisting Federal Usurpation, comments by Theophilus Parsons. We published this back in January of 2015, almost five years ago, but I think it's very important to read today. I will put this link in the show notes. And this is from Rob Nadelson. He said, although Hamilton's Federalist number 28, which is good to read, and Madison's Federalist 46, that's one that I talk about all the time, are justly famous for their exposition of how states and individuals should resist federal usurpation, Parsons was also making the same case about the same time. So he gave this big speech before, six days before Madison published Federalist, Federalist 46, and just a few weeks after Hamilton published uh, Federalist 28. This was in January, January 23rd, 1788. And I'm going to go through a couple of highlights, some important parts of what Parsons had to say. He said, there is another check founded in the nature of the Union, superior to all the parchment checks that can be invented. So no matter how well you organize a government on paper under a constitution, no matter how great that constitution is, it's still a parchment barrier. I did an entire episode talking about Madison's Federalist 48, where he referred to it the same. The constitution is a mere parchment barrier. It does not enforce itself. Although you want to, when you have a constitution, you want it to be structured in a way that reduces the impact or the potential of violations of rights. But if you just sit around and wave constitutions at politicians, you might as well burn the thing because politicians don't want to follow rules given to them. This is just the nature of government. They will never do it on their own unless once in a while, 
you find someone being a good person. But as Patrick Henry warned us, we know that doesn't play out very often, if at all. Patrick Henry would have made the case, and he did actually make the case in Virginia, that it never works out. So it's a parchment barrier. But he said, so Parsons was saying there's another check on power that's better than any parchment barrier that could ever be invented. He said, if there is a usurpation, it will not be on the farmer and merchant employed and attentive only to their several occupations. It will be upon 13 legislatures. So this is the colonies or the states at the time, completely organized, possessed of the confidence of the people and having the means as well as inclination successfully to oppose it. So when the states resist federal usurpation, Parsons is telling us, None but madmen would attempt a usurpation. So it's essential, again, just like Madison said in Federalist 46, to refuse to cooperate with officers of the Union on a state and individual basis when the federal government usurps power. You don't go to the federal court in the hope that the federal courts will say the federal government is usurping power. You resist it as it happens, because soon as you turn a blind eye to it, that's the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed, as Washington warned in 1796. Parsons goes on. He says, an act of usurpation is not obligatory. It is not law. And any man may be justified in his resistance. Let him be considered as a criminal by the general government, yet only his federal fellow citizens can convict him. So he's not only talking about state level resistance, because you can't just rely on one level of government to defeat the other. He's also talking about jury nullification. And this I included in my list of top 10, my favorite founders quotes that I did early last week, last week, Monday. Uh, and this was one of my favorite ones. And he basically said, look, they can, if a jury pronounces someone innocent, not all the powers of Congress can hurt him. And that's what they'll do if the act by the general government, the federal government, is an act of usurpation. So what do we have to do? We have to resist. And for those of you who follow our work, you know we cite Jefferson quite often on this. Nullification is a type of resistance. And Jefferson, in his original draft of the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798, this was sometime be before October of 1798, he says, in cases of an abuse of the delegated power, so improperly using powers delegated to the federal government, he said, the members of the general government being chosen by the people, a change by the people is the con would be the constitutional remedy. So when they just do a bad job or they misuse the powers that have been delegated to them, vote the bums out. That's how you deal. That's when you use voting the bums out, according to Thomas Jefferson. So if you think the the way that they're running the post office is so bad that they need to be replaced, then that's a reason to vote them out. But if they decide to exercise powers that were never delegated to them, then what do you do? And this is how Jefferson put it in 1798, where powers are assumed which have not been delegated. A nullification of the act is the rightful remedy. So if it were going with Jefferson's advice, the vote the bums out mantra that we've heard for so many years, like don't resist these people. We first have to go through an election and get new Republicans in office. I've been told year in and year out. And that just is a failed strategy. And it's also totally opposite of what leading founders like Thomas Jefferson told us. We could dig up others that say the same type of thing when they just misuse the powers that th that have been delegated to them, as long as they're still basically staying within the confines of the Constitution, then vote them out and replace them to people who are going to administer those powers properly. But as soon as they start exercising powers outside of that, then the whole vote the bums out strategy is out the window and you have to start resisting on a state, local, and individual level. Going back to St. George Tucker again, he uses similar language in 1803. He says, acts of Congress to be binding must be made pursuant to the Constitution. For those of you familiar with the supremacy clause of the Constitution, where a lot of people will say all federal acts are supreme, that is a lie. We know that the supremacy clause itself says that federal laws are supreme when made in pursuance of the Constitution. And this is what Tucker is talking about here. He says, look, they're binding as long as they're in pursuit of those 30 to 35 powers delegated throughout the document 
to the federal government. Anything else other than that, he said, they are not laws, but a mere nullity, or what is worse, acts of usurpation. So every single time that they exercise power is not delegated to them, it is a nullity in law, in theory, in principle, an act of usurpation, stealing of power that doesn't belong to them, that belongs to the people of the several states. And then what do you do about it? He's basically saying the exact same thing that Parsons said in 1787. The people are not only not bound by them, not only are they not bound to obey them, he says, but the several departments and officers of the government, both federal and state, are bound by oath to oppose them. I have been more and more, and I probably should have started this many years ago, but I've been more and more focusing on the oath to the Constitution. The founders took this very, very seriously. We see this over and over, leading founder after another, even ones that many people aren't aware of, talking about the oath to the Constitution. Jefferson talked about the oath to the Constitution when he came into office and wouldn't prosecute people under the Alien and Sedition Acts. That was his duty, because even though the judiciary didn't tell him that the law was struck down, it was his job. And that's how the whole, it's basically what we could call departmental view of the Constitution. Everybody takes an oath to the Constitution. And within their sphere of activity, they are supposed to follow the Constitution based on how they view it. They aren't supposed to just wait for the court system to tell them this is constitutional or unconstitutional. Because what ends up happening is then everyone assumes the way that they act in practice is that everything done by government is constitutional and they are supposed to fully enforce everything until a court later on strikes it down. And we don't have a system where that was created where it's ruled by unelected, unaccountable, politically connected lawyers that make up the federal Supreme Court. That's not how it's supposed to be. Everyone's supposed to follow their oath. And if you don't like how someone's following their oath, you either impeach them, you vote them out, whatever. There are other processes for that. But you really want people to literally explain, look, I will not try to enforce this because I believe it to be unconstitutional. Imp That's what a president who follows the Constitution would do. They would say, look, I'm not going to enforce these violations of the right to keep and bear arms. I'm not going to implement this warrantless surveillance program. I'm not going to, even though Congress passed along uh, the ability for me to engage in war with wherever I want to defeat a verb, whatever. I'm not going to do it. And if you don't like it, here's why. I'm going to explain to you, I'm going to use this bully pulpit and explain to you why this is a violation of the Constitution. And it's my duty to not enforce this thing, to not participate in this unconstitutional act. And if you don't like it, impeach me. And that is what a real impeachment should be about. There'd be a lot of examples of that today. So they are not only not bound by a nullity, acts of usurpation, these are the people, but everyone who works in government at every level is bound by their oath of office to oppose them. And Tucker goes on, for being bound by oath to support the Constitution, they must violate that oath whenever they give their sanction by obedience or otherwise to any unconstitutional act of any department of the government. That bears repeating. Every and I'll just put it in my own words, every single time they either just obey, turn a blind eye, or participate in any unconstitutional act, they are violating their oath every single time. And it is not an excuse to say, well, the Supreme Court hasn't told me that this is what uh, I'm supposed to be doing or not supposed to be doing. That is not how the system is supposed to work. But of course, that's how the government people want it to work. They want you to believe that the only way something can be considered unconstitutional is for the court to get to it. Because with 20,000 some odd laws on the books or uh, thousands and thousands of pages of regulations, it's not possible for the Supreme Court, even if they were 100 percent on board with the Constitution, which they're clearly not. They don't even have the physical number of hours in the day, days in the month, months in the year to go through everything that's on the books being enforced by government and strike it all down as unconstitutional, even if that was their role and they were perfect. They just don't. So it creates a de facto situation where unconstitutional acts will always, always continue and never stop. 
looking over at the live chat here. Hopefully you guys are finding this interesting and educational. Bob Brewer, uh, and I appreciate your email. Bob has been asking, maybe I'll mention this, because Bob has been asking me, he's found on his Twitter feed that some people that do live broadcasts through Periscope, which is one of the channels that we're on, uh, Bob is basically getting notifications at the top of his feed, like kind of a premier notification. And he was suggesting that we should do this for 10th Amendment Center's uh, broadcast, The Path to Liberty, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I can't find any way to do this, even through our advertising account, on how to promote this to force it to the top of a feed. I think it's some kind of a partnership. If anyone is familiar with how this works, hit me up. Uh, I, I, Bob, I don't know if you saw it, but I wrote you back and asked if maybe you wanted to reach out to Twitter advertising support. I don't know. I'm assuming if that's even possible for our channel. Uh, it would be very expensive, but if if this is important to you and you want to fund that and really just push it into feeds, uh, we can definitely talk about uh, people sponsoring that and making it happen. But uh, I was getting to something else that Bob was saying about the oath. Uh, it scrolled all the way past. Oh, yeah, here he is. To know the oath, they must know the principles. Second sentence in the Declaration is the most important sentence written in the English language. Yeah, and most of these people, they even if they do know the principles, and what's interesting, a lot of times— when you see an opposing party talking about something that they see as unconstitutional, they have very sound constitutional arguments. They just throw them out the window a lot of times as soon as their team is in charge. So either they're ignoring the principles, they aren't aware of them, they certainly aren't popular to hold to them. And I think that actually has to come from the people. The people have to make following the Constitution and constitutional principles really, really important. And that's why it's so important to pay attention to other shows, not just mine. Of course, hopefully I do a really good job on this, but people like Chris Ann Hall has a great uh, broadcast that she does, I think almost every day, but it depends on her travel schedule. But she's pretty regular on her show. Uh, the Ron Paul Liberty Report covers a lot of good things, but so many other programs. Jacob Hornberger over at Future of Freedom Foundation, FFF.org, does a lot of talk about constitutional issues as well. So it's really important for people to get educated on this as well. Essential Freedom over in Missouri says, guilty of treason, pointed out they are all guilty of treason. Absolutely. Well, or usurpation, I think Tucker w went a little more aggressive. He's saying it's treason against the sovereignty of the people. That wasn't a criminal treason as listed in the Constitution, but I think the words were used to really make an impact of how bad it is. Even the smallest amount of usurpation is really, really problematic and should be resisted all the time. Uh, Essential Freedom also points out this is something we're going to be covering here very soon. Missouri has introduced the Second Amendment Preservation Act. It's both in the House and the Senate. Senate bill is SB 588, House bill HB 1637. I'm glad you sent that over to me. I think it was by email because I missed that when I was looking through bills last week. And this would basically take on every federal gun control measure, past, present, or future. We definitely want to get behind that. People like Ron Calzone at Missouri First uh, as well will be leading the charge on that in Missouri. But it's not just uh, gun control. It's surveillance. It's the Federal Reserve System. It's asset forfeiture. So many things that the federal government is involved in and funds the states to do as well that violate the Constitution. We're going to be hearing a lot about legislation to push back on that on the state and local level in the very near future. I uh, appreciate Justin Bailola. It says, thanks, MB. Great show. Funky euphemism. If we use original meaning, then we can't pretend Congress, Article 1, Section 8 is giving Congress control for a bloated welfare system. Absolutely. <laughs> Without a doubt. Um, if you want to hear current events by discussed by constitutional law attorney, you should check my p podcast out. Funky euphemism. Post a link to it or actually email me a link too, or post it in the archives because I think the live broadcast and I don't have access to all the uh, uh, control features. A lot of times if you post a link in the live chat on YouTube, for example, it will filter that out. And then also over in the live chat, I see some chat with uh, Robert Sanderson. Wouldn't be refusing to fund withhold chat taxes to their shenanigans also be a rightful remedy? That is a remedy. I don't know if there are enough people willing to do that, but I think there is a strategy. We've talked about this in the past. There's a proposal on a state by state level to create a federal tax escrow fund. Basically, the state, if you could trust the states, I think there's a problem there as well with this big of a thing. You can't really trust the states either. They're all bad. Uh, maybe in one state, you'll find one of them doing something good on one issue and another state and another issue and on and on. But all encompassing, the theory would be that you would basically the state would 
would interpose between you and the federal government on taxes. I don't know how that's necessarily going to play out. And I think there's a lot of constitutional questions back and forth. But in theory and in principle, it makes sense to me. Because why should they even be able to steal the money from you in the first place if the, all that money is being used to fund unconstitutional programs? So all that, uh, all those taxes are unconstitutional, even if you agree that the 16th Amendment should exist. They're funding all kinds of stuff. They're stealing from you to fund all kinds of stuff for powers that they stolen from you. So double theft. It's a great point. I appreciate you bringing that up, Robert. Anyways. I think I'm just not following everything that's in the chat. There's a lot of really interesting back and forth. I will check this out. Bob also pointed out United Precious Metal Association. If you're interested in sound money, it's upma.org. And uh, Shane Lackey, consent. Do not consent. Talking about how a free government based on consent, if you don't, if you continue to consent to usurpations, eventually that government will be as if it was founded by force. Anyways, I hope you found this really interesting. I hope you found it educational. Most importantly, of course, I hope you learned something. I hope you had a great weekend and your week is off to an awesome start. I really appreciate you spending some time with me. If you enjoyed the show, smash the like button, leave some comments, subscribe, uh, join our membership program, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members, as little as two bucks a month. We make it go a long, long way. And I appreciate so many of you I see out here who are current members. Uh, I'm very grateful for that. Don't feel obligated to join us, especially if you can't financially. But if you can or you're really compelled to do so, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, I will have the show notes up over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty in a little bit here. And I appreciate you joining me today. I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.